thanks for joining us today uh, for a webinar about why your SDRs are churning and how you can retain them. We're going to solve all your problems. We still have a few people uh, trickling in, so we're just going to give them a quick minute. And while we're doing that, can you uh, go in the Q&A box and just introduce yourself? Let us know who's here. Hey, Colin, another interesting thing might be uh, to ask the audience if there's a specific thing they want to talk about today. We have a lot of yeah. topics from hiring, onboarding, comp plans, um, so we can take this in many different directions. So if there's any specific uh, ideas that people have, uh, yeah, tell them below I love and that. we'll answer. Let's yeah, we're going to be taking questions throughout. Feel free to sneak your question in early. We've got uh, Matt from UserZoom. Hi, Matt. Uh, Lupi from Modesto. California, West Coaster, nice. All right, a bunch more people coming in here. Taylor at an SDR manager at a company called Thanks. Shout out to Thanks. Thanks for coming, Taylor. <laughs> nice. <Bye>. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got Max from Portland, Oregon. All kinds of people joining. Um, nice. Thanks for typing in, everybody. Feel free to continue to use that. We're going to answer questions as we go. We're not going to save them towards for the end. Um, so use the Q&A feature. A uh, couple things before we really dive into some problem solving today. So um, first things first, if you have to hop off or something interrupts you, that's okay. We're going to send out the recording to everybody after. Um, so you know, don't don't sacrifice closing something for us. Uh, we would want everybody to close stuff. We want everybody to set meetings. Um, if, you, if you think a colleague would benefit, feel free to forward the link when we send it out. Um, use the Q&A feature. Try not to use the chat feature because we're all looking at the Q&A feature and it'll be easier to see it. Uh, and that's about it for, for housekeeping stuff. So today we're talking about SDR churn. Uh, it's kind of a position that's well known for having short tenure, high churn. Um, but we're going to talk about first and foremost why that's actually a problem. A lot of people kind of view it as the nature of the beast, it's just the way it is. It's an entry level role, but that's really not the case. So we're going to talk about that. And then throughout the life cycle of SDR, if you want to call it BDR, we're talking about the same thing from hiring to coaching to uh, their comp plans to career development. We're going to talk about all these different stages throughout that life cycle of things that you can do to try to um, not just set them up for success, but also um, set them up to stay in your organization and contribute value for a longer period of time. Um, and there are so, so many reasons and great anecdotes coming from our uh, guests today about why that's important. So our guests are Tito. Tito Bort is the founder and CEO of Alti Sales. He's an investor of many other businesses. Alti Sales helps B2B businesses book more meetings with AltiSales' own incredible team of, um, I think, more than 20 now SDRs, right, Tito? Yeah, we're growing quickly. Yeah. Um, he also helps with uh, training, and they kind of take consulting and expand it beyond just what normal consulting is. He's basically made SDR success and SDR management his entire life, so he's all about it. And this year, Tito, you have 0% churn on your team of SDRs, right? Yep, 0% yeah. churn which is awesome. So we're talking to the right. He knows how to do this. He's going to share all of his secrets. Um, and then we also have Scott Barker, who is head of partnerships at Sales Hacker. Uh, he's managed SDR teams in the past. He's been a BDR at a couple of places. He's been in closing roles. Um, he actually wasn't even originally on the docket today, but he is so passionate about this topic. <laughs> jumped in and we're really happy to have him because he, he loves this topic so much. Hey, Scott. Thanks, man. Now pumped to be here. Definitely business development is uh, near and dear to my heart. So excited to be here. And one thing you forgot, Tito over here, weren't you just named sales development leader of the year as well? That's right. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> I missed it. I don't, I don't know how I, how I won of the it, year. But, uh, but Globally. It was, it was cool. This guy knows what he's talking about. Excited to, to dive into it. The humility, Tito. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so let's start this off because one thing that I've always heard um, is, oh, SDR, that's an entry level role. These kids are just out of college and they call them kids just out of college. You can't expect them to stick around long. They don't know what they're doing. Um, 
but I have a feeling that you guys don't necessarily agree with that. Tito, what's your take on that? Yeah. Um, the, the way I usually explain that is um, SDR being an entry level role. I, I say SDR is like a sport. So imagine comparing your SDR team to a basketball team. So playing basketball is also an entry level role. I mean, anybody can go pick up a ball and, and bounce it around and, and try to get a bucket or two. Yet a good SDR team is like a pro basketball team while an entry level SDR team is like uh, five friends trying to grab a ball and play some basketball together, right? So yep. it might be an entry level role, but if you get really good at it, the difference between uh, LeBron James and an entry level basketball player it's just gigantic. Yeah. And, um, and it's important that they ramp up to that level of being like the NBA basketball player. Cause ultimately the role is to set meetings for sales, sales drives revenue, obviously. So um, you had a cool story about like measuring the cost or the impact on an organization of SDR turnover that you told me earlier. Can you share that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, th there's so many ways to, to look at this, right? Um, what's interesting in, in terms of productivity is that if you look at your best AE versus like your average AE, usually your best AE is at like 20, 30% higher performance, right? Let's say their quote has a million, like your best AE might have 1.2 million. Your average AE is at like 800, 900K. Uh, and then like your worst AE might be at like 500K and then they get, they get fired or they get let go. Um, when you look at SDRs and you actually follow their deals through pipeline and into closing, you find that like usually your best SDRs are sometimes like five to 10 Xing their peers, which is just ridiculous. So it's the same comparison of like having LeBron James on your team versus like any other basketball player. Like we all know the, the huge impact that a fantastic player can have. So if you look at the salary comparisons, like how much does the average basketball player make? probably not a lot of money when you look at like all the leagues but if you get into like the w best performing teams like the best paid person in basketball is most likely a player and not a coach or you know a manager of like the team operations or whatever it is right so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah scott do you have a, something to add yeah, I've, I've just seen that that again and again, you know, is that when, when you find these key players for your team, you like you have to hold on to them for to your life. And not not just because, yes, they're making 10x meetings, the amount of everyone else, but they're also showing everyone else on the basketball team that it's possible to book that many meetings, you know, especially if you're a startup or just building uh, a, a team out. A lot of times, you know, there's the C-suite gets in a room. They crunch some numbers and they're like, here's how many meetings you should hit. And they've never tried to do it. They don't know what they're doing and they've got these goals. And then you've just got this team and they're just banging their head against the wall trying to do it. And if they can see someone crushing that, the, the motivation and the ripple effect that happens throughout the entire team and, and organization is, is, is pretty big. Yeah. And so I think, the, you know, it's possible the reason a lot of people don't see SDR turnover as a problem is because, well, maybe there's a bunch of reasons, but one of the reasons is that a lot of the emphasis on like loss to an organization is placed on the AE because they're in the closing role, right? But if you think about that AE working with a team of SDRs and the SDRs are constantly turning over, what's your chance of retaining the AE? It's not very good. That's correct. Uh, like the AEs yeah. get frustrated when they when yeah. they don't have pipeline, right? And yeah. and then if they need to prospect on their own, which I think they always should prospect a little bit and get some deals, but they're having to pull the weight for like ninety percent of their pipeline on top of like closing, uh, closing their deals. Um, then they get frustrated and they leave. So it's not only a problem of like if your SDRs are churning, what's the cost of the SDR churning is your increased li likelihood that your AE will churn as well. Um, and then that that just is a you know, domino effect in uh, lost opportunity and, and lost revenue. Yeah. Totally agree. And, and, and I, sorry, just a quick other point there. It's like beyond that, there's also just this massive loss of frontline prospect and industry knowledge. I think, you know, not enough organizations give their BDRs or their SDRs a platform to actually share all the knowledge that they're learning. So again, if you're, if you're starting out and, and this information is invaluable to you, well, when you lose one of your SDRs or BDRs, all that information goes with them. And you essentially have to build this knowledge bank back up from, from scratch every time. And again, leads to credible frustration through marketing, through AEs, through people who are building the product. Uh, again, the ripple effects are massive. 
But to your point, Tito, if, if your SDR team, if an organization's SDR team is comprised entirely of average or below average contributors, right, it would be maybe less of a problem retention, the poor retention of that team would be less of a problem. Um, or there's a coaching issue. But in order for retention to matter, really, you have to be able to attract good SB SDRs in the first place, people who are um, ready to do the job. And that's a hard thing to do, too, because it's such in demand role. Um, I, I posted up a graph on LinkedIn the other day, the graphs going up and to the right. I don't know if I'm mirrored, but it's going up and to the right. <laughs> and, uh, it, and it's just being like searched more on Google. Um, expectations for the role are lower than they have ever have been. People are requiring less experience to hire into SDRs. Um, so like, you know, it's hard to uh, find in that whole sea of demand for the role, the right people uh, to make retention really become a focus in the first place. So like, how do you hire Tito and how do you go about um, making high, like starting the retention process during your hiring and interviewing process? Yeah, that's a great question. Let's get very tactical here. I think it's going to be useful yeah. for the audience, right? So um, one of the things that people uh, always talk about, especially my network of like SDR managers, they're like, oh, my SDRs come in here and after three months, they want to get promoted to AE or SDR manager, right? And most people will want to blame that on the SDRs and be like, oh, these entitled millennials, like they suck, <laughs> right? But it's, it's actually not true. Like what, what you got to do is set up the right expectations, right? So for us, yep. for example, um, and, you know, I, uh, I, I run a team of SDRs, so we have the, uh, the, the experience of doing this on a daily basis. But every time we interview somebody, we set up the very clear expectations. In this role, you're going to be making 90 to 100 dials a day. And we expect you to hold this role for 12 to 18 months. And within that window of 12 to 18 months, we, we want to promote you to another different like role and or because we're an outdoor sales organization, sometimes we are uh, promoting you into our clients' companies as well. Um, and that just helps the SDRs come in with the right mindset. Yeah, and Scott, having held some of these uh, positions and having hired SDRs, BDRs before, um, you've learned from experience what works and doesn't work in interviews. So how do you assess for skills and performance during interviews? Like what are good questions to ask? What are bad questions to ask? Yeah, I think first and foremost, before you go that, I don't think there's a one size fits all, right? You have to find what makes an SDR or BDR uh, successful at your individual organization. There's, there's a few like coachability is going to be probably universal learning agility. So the, the ability to pick things up very quickly um, will be another one. And then like soft skills, the ability to speak and write uh, effectively and efficiently uh, and, and think on your feet. So those are pretty much universal ones that I don't think anyone would, would argue with. Um, when I interview uh, like, 100% we're doing a role play. Like it, even if it's the first, like after maybe the initial like 50 minute coffee meeting to see if it's actually worth like bringing them in for a, an interview, then we're, we're for sure role playing. And uh, I, I actually stole this from Mark Roberts, which I think is amazing uh, to test for coachability. You do a role play and then you, you stop and you give them feedback and then you do a, a second role play uh, right after it. And you see if, the advice that you've given them if they're able to apply that. Because if they can apply that with, with five, 10 minutes of coaching, imagine what they can do in, with, with months and months of that. It just means they're a, they're a quick learner on their feet. Um, a big thing, so that was one to test, test coachability. For, for like soft skills, I would always just try and get them to interact with as many people uh, within the organization as, uh, as possible. Uh, when they're actually in in office and just see how that person feels in that first like two three minutes of their interaction with with that that potential candidate because that's essentially what they're doing all day on the phones is first impressions first impressions first impressions so if you can't make a good first impression when you're in there when you're like in the zone ready to rock at an interview then how are you going to make good first impressions all day long on, on a phone so those are two things that i i've found to be pretty good good tests and having been in a, in a hiring position, in a role that I was hiring people before, I know that there's often pressure to make hires quickly. And that one of the things that can really undermine a good hiring process is being, is being under the pressure to make hires quickly. And it's, 
it's tempting to hear pushback uh, or hear like they don't adapt to your coaching in the second role play or to hear pushback on the expectations that you're setting in terms of how long they'll stay in the role and what their day-to-day looks like. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there anything that you did or Tito that you did to help a deal with uh, that pushback on expectations in the, during the interview, or do you just walk away? Uh, And then also like, you know, how do you keep yourself honest and hold yourself accountable for maintaining your standards in the hiring process? Mm -hmm. I mean, ideally, what do you what do you want to do? Uh, what, we, what we do internally, and this is kind of like drifting a little bit away from from the churning part of of uh, the conversation. But uh, when it comes to the hiring part, we always try to have at least one or two people that are ready to be hired um, that that we've set aside, right? So we interview. We mostly interview passive candidates. We hardly ever interview active candidates that are actively looking for a job. Because what we want to do is we want to have two people that we're like ready to hire and onboard when space opens up. So as soon as leadership says, okay, we have another headcount, uh, we have another two people headcount for our SDR team, I can just ping the two people who I interviewed a month ago and be like, hey, Johnny, ready to hire you. Put your two-week two notice. We'll see you here in a sec, right? And, uh, and then that, that works incredibly well. Now, most organizations are very reactive. They're like, they're yeah. like, working to put off fires and uh and then that's a problem and and perhaps when that's happening is because your um, manager to sdr ratio is just too skewed right we we try to keep it to one to six to one to eight at the most but if you're like one to ten or one to twelve it's gonna be impossible to run your one-on-ones you know uh get your hiring done manage all the projects like get all the things rolling so mm-hmm. and that's another thing too is- so the, the manager ratio that you just mentioned, you're like basically cutting it in half. And I imagine that has a big effect, not just on like how able you are to hire, but how able everybody is to be coached, the time spent, right? And that has an effect on retention. How do you see that play out? Definitely 100%. I mean, one of the reasons why SDRs are joining companies is, is for the learning experience, right? So if you can sell them on the expertise of what they're going to learn while they're with you on how they're going to be good. Like, it's funny, like Scott was talking about the role play, right? When we interview people, um, we do the role play and then I participate in those and I show, I come, I come to the interview. I have him pitch me a product that I have him you know, like learn about during the interview process. And then I pitch that product back and they're like, oh my God, this is insane. You did this and this and this and this different than I did. Why did you do that? They get really curious and they're like, Tito, I just want to learn more from you. And I'm like, that's the reason you should join our company and stay as an SDR for 12 to 16 months. Because when you do that, you're going to learn all these things about the sales development process. And even when you become an AE and you need to build part of your own pipeline, if you can build more pipeline than any other AE, chances are that you're going to win uh, end of the day. So um, set up the right expectations and, and really have them come in for the learning experience. For us, our managers with every SDR, they have a one hour, one-on-one, a 30 minute kind of like campaign review and checking and training for what they're doing. And then we have office hours, right? So both the head of sales development and myself, any SDR can show up and be like, oh, Tito's office hours, you know, um, I'm having problems with X, Y, Z, or I want to change this, or there's like some things that are in the back of my mind that I need to resolve. And we talk about solutions, not problems. So they bring us the problem and the solution always together or their best recommendation for how to solve it. And through that, uh, we make our SEOs really happy about the workflow and how things are uh, being run at the company. And that just keeps them really happy and, and they just want to stick around longer. Wait, STRs aren't only motivated by money, Tito? They actually want to learn things? I think that their primary motivation is always to learn things. And, and yeah, of course, yeah. like anybody in this world, if you're – if you're paying them a salary that doesn't cover their costs, right, where they're struggling to pay rent, of course they want money. And, and you know, they might start taking gigs on the side, start driving for Uber, come up really tired in the morning because they're driving the, the previous night. Like, just look at your market. And we try to pay above, above average, right? So in the Bay Area, our base salary is like 60K and then our OT is 100K. And our average uh, for the team, we're like at 111% of quota. So like nice. if you're in the Bay Area working for Alti Sales, you should definitely be making over 100K. And then we adapt salaries according to locations, right? So if you're in Miami, Florida, where I am sitting at the moment, uh, your base salary and your commission structure will be a little bit different adapting to, to the local economy. And we, we also have a bunch of like LATAM-based SDRs 
So I have like uh, kind of like uh, Native Americans that moved and are expats in like Colombia or Mexico and that uh, they've been SDRs for other companies. And we also adapt their salaries for, for their local areas. And we're always paying significantly above market. So let's so, say um, that's a good, a good thing to talk about. We're, I want to talk more about comp in a second, but I want, also want to drill further into your thoughts on training, because like you said, your management ratio allows your managers to spend more time with SDRs. Um, so they're doing training and coaching ongoing. Aside from the setting example early on, like here's why you should stay, here's all the things you're going to learn. How do you run, uh, how do you run training? Like what are the things that they do during those trainings, during coaching sessions on an ongoing basis to, to keep SDRs learning and keep them interested? Yeah, so it's a lot of role play. Um, the way we, we execute on this, and I did another uh, webinar uh, with Sales Hacker as well about how to measure the effectiveness of uh, cold calling, right, or how VP should do it. So we actually break our cold call into different steps, um, and we can measure how many people get stuck in the, like, hey, call in, this is Tito with Alti Sales. Do you have a couple minutes, or how are you doing today? If you get caught off there and people are like, I can't talk and they hang up on you, yeah. we're recording exactly at what part of the interaction are you getting stuck. And we have our internal alti sales based benchmarks according to the personas you're reaching out to, where I know that this percentage should be 70%, this one, this one is 80, this one's 30, this one's 40, and whatever it is for our funnel. Um, I don't want to give up my, all my secrets, right? But <laughs> yep. essentially, we can know exactly where you're having problems. And with that, we can come in and say, okay, you're having problem with this part of the call. Let's just practice that back and forth. And sometimes it's what you say. Sometimes it's a tone of voice. Sometimes it's, it's like how you're saying it. There's a lot of things to fix. And you need somebody who has experience to understand what the problem is so you can coach them on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you'll earn a lot of respect from your SDRs if you're able to show them that you know what works better than, than they can out of just like guesswork. Yeah. So it's more than just like, hey, you're not making enough calls or, hey, your emails are good, but your calls suck. It's, it's drilling into the actual recordings of the calls or shadowing them and finding the little instances where they lose attention. Exactly right. I mean, as, a, as an SDR manager, one metric that if you're not keeping uh, track of you're losing is your, your dial to demo ratio. Like how many dials does it take to, to get a demo? And if your SDRs are like at 300 or 400 dials a demo, uh, and this is for cold outbound, right? But if there are 300, 400 dials a demo, you probably don't need more dials. You need better quality, right? You need better quality conversations. You need better quality connections. Um, and then I would take, like, that, take, take yeah. that further and do connection to demo as well. Like make sure, like once they are getting a hold of people, because some people are really good at, you know, maybe research and finding the right information, but then they're just burning through those connects and they're not converting into demos. So that's another metric that's super important. Yeah, hundred percent right. And then you got to figure out uh, again, like we measure it step by step, right? So we go dial to connect, connect to hook accepted, hook accepted to pitch accepted, pitch accepted to gap discovery, gap discovery to demo, right? And, and, and that's how we find exactly where your, uh, where your problem is. Um, and then like if the connect is low, I don't need to coach the SDR. I got to get better data. I got to work with my data team and, and figure out, do I need another data tool? Uh, or how do I get more direct dials? Or are we calling too high in the organization? Is that why we're getting so few connections? And so on. So uh, when your team sees you really get granular and work on these things uh, at a deep level, and they understand how management is like busting, you know, their head, like, figuring out how to how to make their job easier they get really loyal and they get really excited about leadership if they feel like you're just like always increasing their goals and changing their comp and underpaying them and nobody's hitting their goals uh and they don't see you really being a partner to them in their success uh they're gonna leave you yeah yeah i mean you know, like sdrs it seems stupid to even have to say it but sdrs are people too if you treat them like a meeting setting machine they're not going to like it. You have to invest your time in them, giving them valuable coaching like you do. You have to like make their job doable. Don't just expect more and more of them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, Scott, like you've been in this position. You've probably seen this from a few different places. What other things can managers do to like keep SDRs excited and uh, empowered about the job? 
Yeah, so I was actually super lucky when I started, uh, when I built out my first like business development program, I started as a player coach. So I was actually just a, a team lead that was doing, building all the processes, bringing in all the tech, uh, but I was just a team lead. So I still had a, a quota. And during the time I was like, this is insane. Like I, I can't do both. Like there's so much going on, but looking back, as I hired out my team, they all saw me doing this function and I led from the front. You know, I was at the top of the leaderboard and I would doing all these other things. And they would, when they would see me do that, they're like, okay, I'll listen to this guy because he's, he's out there and he's, he's doing it. So I think if you can put yourself in that position, even if you just do it for a month as a manager, like get on the phones and let people see that, that you can do it and that it inspires like a fierce amount of loyalty because they they see you doing it you're leading from the front and you're giving them all this information that's going to help them make more money um like i i think i could call up the the guys that, that first started with me um at that org and and steal them from from anywhere just because we you know you grow together and there's like there's so much there's so much there right and i think that's why Tito has, has created such amazing loyalty as well. It's just because everyone respects the fact that, you know, Tito knows what he's talking about. You know, it's not just pulling metrics out of the, the sky. So I think that's a big one. Uh, other thing I'll mention just for, from motivation. So there's uh, obviously growth is a big one that people are looking for. Money's another one that has to be taken care of. And Another one I, uh, we identified at my last uh, organization was this like status piece. People, I think young people coming up now in the age of like social media and Instagram and LinkedIn and all this stuff, they want to be recognized um, amongst their peers as, as like, you know, uh, a leader. So we set up little micro promotions throughout their, you know, 12 months or, or 18 months. Um, where they could go from, you know, BDR to senior BDR. Once they were senior BDR, that's when they would help with, with some of the coaching activities that we were doing. Uh, they were now, you know, producing enough that they had a really good voice to kind of coach and teach other SDRs. Didn't Did even you come a with a bump too when it became senior BDR. Or was it just a it status? It was fairly even... nominal. It was fair. It was, it, we gave one, but it was, it was, that wasn't the point. And we, we kind of like put it on them. Like when we were first playing with this, it's like, do you want a pay bump or, or do you want this title? And everyone was like more pumped on the title for sure. Mm. So um, we gave them a small pay bump. They were now allowed to train. They were seen as more of a leader in front of their peers. And then we did one more uh, after that. Um, that was, it was called sales specialist or key account. I can't remember what we worded it, but they essentially would actually also help uh, customer success and try and grow some of the accounts that our customer success team uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't handle basically. And so that was just grooming them to uh, have some of the skills that they'd need when they hit the next promotion, which was typically AE because they would get some, some new skills baked in, but they were still responsible for their, uh, their meeting goal. So, so what about like tools or enablement? What are the things that um, generally teams should think about putting in place to make uh, SDRs roles like more possible and avoid burnout? Have you ever heard of outreach calling? <laughs> that, wasn't, that wasn't the intention of that question, but I am curious. And there's a question here in the, in the Q&A actually about, uh, it's from Max in Portland. He's asking Tito, what kind of CRM or software are you using for calls? So that's what made me think of it. Yeah, we, we run all our dials to outreach. Um, and it's just because we can pick the dispositions and it just makes it really, really, really easy. I've used other like dialers before. Like I remember I've been running SDR team since like 2012. So uh, before we were using Vonage, we used uh, Avaya. We've used like a, a, a variety of Vocalocity, which then got acquired by Vonage, uh, Ring Central. I've used a bunch of them, uh, but like today it makes no, no sense to have separate systems for phone and email, just put them together. Um, so for me, outreach is, is what we use in house. Mm -hmm. I think like taking it, you, you basically need really good data. So a few data tools, I would not just hang your hat on one. So you need like, you know, zoom info, discover or lead IQ, maybe a mixture of them. They need a sales engagement tool like outreach. 
uh, you, you're going to want to, you know, CRM of course, and then you put LinkedIn sales nav and you're pretty much off to, to the races. There's of course a, a whole slew of other things that you can do to create small efficiencies and things. But I think if you have those nailed, um, you can, they can do their job for sure. Colin, I want to I want to highlight one other thing that is uh, causing a lot of SDR churn, which which a lot of people are not very aware of, and it's because they're not seeing it from like the SDR perspective. So, one of the things that I talk about is um, AEs are very used to their OTE being uh, a little bit aggressive, meaning like if you get hired as a as an AE, uh, your comp is like 100 base, uh, 200 OTE type of thing you know that chances are you're going to end up at around 160 to like 190. Like you're going to be somewhere in that range. Like if you hit your, your goal, you're, it's actually like really good. And even your EFOs are benchmarking for only 60% of the team kind of like hitting their quota. Um, you cannot do that with, uh, with SDRs. And the reason you cannot do that is because the SDRs, most of them are either coming from like career changes of um, some other type of like, role that wasn't sales and or they're coming right out of college and in college when you hear what your goal is right if you're in college they're like cool what's my goal for this class they're like well you know your your own target earnings like if you hit your targets you should pass the class so they're associating like a c is my target and if i get an a i'm an excellent right yeah. and, and whatever role they were in before even if you're in marketing like your goals and whatever like they're, they're usually they're usually attaining. So when they come to the SDR role, you tell them that their OT is seventy, like or eighty or ninety or whatever they are, and you're you're like, as an as a employee, you're like setting your expectations for that. I'm like budgeting for eighty k, and heads up, I don't even know about how the tax system works. So like this happened to me in my in my first role out of college, right? I I get an offer, I budget for it. I'm like this is going to be amazing. I, I get my first paycheck, and of course there's like. 40% of it is gone to taxes, which I somewhat expected. I thought it was going to be 30, but ended up being a little bit over 40 because I was in California. I'm like, ugh, that sucks. Okay, I guess I'm like 10 grand down for the year now. Ouch. Where am I going to find that money? I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like, I am not just going to hit quota. I'm going to exceed quota by 30%. I'll make it up. And then what I realized like three months later is, wait a second, nobody in the company is hitting quota. Zero. So me getting to 130% is impossible. Now I'm in deep financial trouble and nobody set up my expectations correctly. So I get to leave and I got to cancel my lease and I got to switch apartments and I got to reset my expectations. And it's now too late and you hate your boss and your company for not giving you that perspective. So what we do is we let you talk to the employees. We give you everybody's like goals. We're like, here it is. Like this person hit this percentage and this person hit this percentage and here's their like, goals and here's how much they made like when you come in you know exactly what you budget for you know exactly what you, how you how to think about your role and you know exactly what you need to do to get promoted to get to the next level those things are fundamental to SDR success so we've actually got a question here about comp from Anna um, and since you have SDRs in lots of different places this is a question for you Tito so she's asking what's the comp you pay for SDRs in Miami versus uh, San Francisco yeah, so here's what, what we recommend. And we have SDRs distributed, so, in, so they're in different markets. And we're usually looking at the, at the local economies and comparable salaries. So like we actually go look at uh, salaries in the area and see where they range. But I'll give you some like benchmarks. I, uh, I would be setting up my SDR, man, uh, my SDR uh, salaries in the Bay Area at around, and it depends on their experience. Like if they're entry level, perhaps a 50, 30 is a, is a good range. If they're like senior SDRs, more like 60, 40, so 100K OTE, uh, and make sure that that OTE is attainable, right? So they should be able to get to 100. That's in San Francisco or New York. If you're more in like Miami or like Atlanta or cities that aren't as expensive, um, you, could, you could go, you know, for a junior entry-level role to the 40, 45 base range, and then 65 to 70, 75. It, it all depends. Um, it all depends on where kind of they're located. Right, so adapt to your local economy. There's a really good website that I use called Numbio. Uh, it's like number, but instead of an R, an O. Um, I use it because it's global, but it will 
tell you about the cost of living across different geographies. Uh, so you can compare San Francisco to Miami and it'll tell you Miami is 20% cheaper. So I kind of go by that and I'm like, okay, so if my OT in, in, in San Francisco is 100K, I should make my OT in Miami 80K. And then I compare like Miami to like, you know, Little Rock, Arkansas. And I'm like, okay, Arkansas is like 20% less than Miami. So instead of 80, we, we can make it 65 type of thing. Um, and the reason we do that so in depth is because we're an outsourced sales development company. So like we really need to play with those margins and figure out yeah. what's actually fair and really good for the employees. Um, yet at the same time gives the company margins because I need to charge my clients for that salary type of thing. Uh, you don't need to get that anal. And especially like if you have like SDRs in multiple geographies, like if you have New York and San Francisco, the cost of living difference is, is like 3%. Don't just lower their salary 3%. Like, don't get caught in the new ones. Uh, just when it's, there's a big difference, uh, like Arkansas to San Francisco, feel free to reset, reset expectations and reset salaries there. Uh, thanks for that. I'm sure Anna's glad you gave her so much info on that. So there are actually a, really a couple other good questions about <laughs> activities. And since we're talking about retaining SDRs, uh, Carrie has a few good ac questions about activities. So she's asking, what's the email and call activity quota for your SDRs? And what's the quota for meetings booked? From a retention standpoint, Tito, I know you also have feelings about activities SDRs should not be doing because it leads to burnout. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on all that. Yeah, I'll show, I might show my screen here and, and, and show a couple of things uh, because there's a graph that, that I wanna show that will determine kind of like the, the numbers of meetings booked. So I, I not only run my own SDR teams, but I also um, kind of like, interview a bunch of SDRs from different companies and learn about their processes. And like in some organizations, their sales qualified opportunities that they need to produce per month is like two, which is really low, but these are like million dollar deals. So if you produce $2 million in pipeline per month, it's $24 million a year. They close 10%. You close $2 million worth of deals from an SDR that's called outbound. That's amazing. Right. On the other end of the spectrum, there's companies that let, where you're like, uh, average deal size is like 5k so it could be as high as like 50 meetings a month now let me give you more direction because that's like completely useless information at the moment right so for us all our emails are automated completely in the sense that like every SDR who's like phone based has a junior uh, data researcher slash junior SDR who is uh, gathering all the data. So they're going on the LinkedIn profiles, finding what universities they attended, what languages they speak, what's their previous experience. And then they're going and, and drafting on outreach, the email um, kind of like step-by-step uh, -step, uh, process to personalize. And then the senior SDR who's on the phone, who is who we actually call our SDRs, they just click send, 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 and or like it's automatically sent. So for us, it's a hundred calls and a hundred emails per day is what we benchmark to each frontline customer facing SDR, yet they're highly enabled. And the number of meetings, when it's cold outbound, you're not getting any warm leads from marketing, there's no inbound requests, you're purely cold outbound, I think a very fair range is between six and 15. Six if your deals are over 100K selling to C level, um, and then 15 if you're like very SMB. Uh, the average in the industry is around 10, and I, I would agree with that. So what about uh, research? Are your SDRs doing their own research? Zero. We have a team that's managed by our head of operations that does all the research for them. So that's going to be a little bit different uh, compared to most SDR organizations that they're having the SDRs do the research. The reason we don't have the SDRs themselves do the research is because we strongly believe that that's the part that they hate the most about their work. Uh, it's a skill that you learn really quickly and there's no further progress in how you do research. It's not a very useful skill uh, in the future either. So, um, and then it's not a high value skill. Like it can be so anybody else doing uh, almost as good or sometimes even better research. Uh, somebody in a different geography who has a lower cost, right? So if you have a San Francisco based SDRs doing research and they're making 50 calls a day and spending half their day doing research, I, you might as well, you know, as you grow your team rather than growing SDRs, hire data researchers in in Philippines, in Latin America, go to Bolivia, go to Peru, find people who are willing to work for $6 an hour and hire those. Like your internal SDRs are costing you, if their OT is 100K, they're costing you 50 bucks an hour. Go find somebody for, for a tenth of the price and have them do that work. So they, my SDRs don't do any research. 
And from a retention standpoint, I bet your STRs love that. Oh yeah, hundred percent. They feel almost like AEs. They're like conversation based rather than yeah. uh, having to be like uh, doing a bunch of like uh, you know nitty gritty, boring, tedious work. Yeah, and we and we talked about expectation setting earlier, and you know you do a good job uh, during the interview process of telling them what their job is going to be like. If they all of a sudden come into the job and it's like surprise, 40 percent of your day is spent doing research. Uh, they're going to sit there thinking, well, this isn't what I was hired for. It's not what I'm really, it's not what I want to do. Right. So um, that's a good tip too for retention. Uh, I see a bunch of questions coming in. Yeah, so many questions. Um, uh, I can answer you. some of these really quickly. I'll do rapid fire. So like, cool. do you still see value in cold calling? A hundred percent. You gotta, you gotta make a bunch of calls uh, that's going to help you. And then of course, inbound leads, call them immediately, be really quick with it. But uh, any other leads, like we we source 95% of our meetings through co complete cold call outbound from people who have never even seen an email from us. So cold calling works. You just need to learn how to do it. Uh, it's like anything. Does uh, using a bow and arrow to go hunting works? Yes. But if you never use a bow and arrow, good luck. You're not going to hunt an elephant with a bow and arrow if you've never <laughs> used it. So please... First, before saying is cold calling worth it, the way you are going to think about it is, is developing my skills in cold calling going to help me book meetings? And the answer to that is yes. There's like the foresight call camp. Uh, I have a bunch of cold calling interviews uh, and, and trainings online. If anybody wants to sign up for training, uh, you, I, I do it. We record it for about an hour. I have you cold call me on a live call like this on Zoom. And then uh, after that, I turn it around and then I, I pitch you and then I show you all the learnings. So the cold calling definitely works. Um, I don't know. Take them up on that if you're a BDR and SCR. List. Yeah, I don't miss that opportunity. That's invaluable. Hit them up. Yeah. And then another question comes about inbound versus outbound SCRs, comp plans. Uh, really interesting question. Uh, they have to be different, yet you need to know where to draw the line between inbound and outbound. So let me actually... I might, uh, I might share my screen here for a second and show you a PowerPoint that I have uh, about the cost of sales and how like organizations should think about it. But here's like a really good view I of like this. view of like what the role of sales development is, right? So when it's an inbound and this is a hand raise, right? This is somebody saying, "Hey, I want to talk to sales." Like the role of the role of sales development is tiny. It's like, let's coordinate the time and let's just make sure you're not like a complete waste of time for my AE and let, let me get you into a meeting. All right, Tino, can you uh, bring the Q&A thing down? It's just kind of covering it a little bit. Oh, is it? So. Or is that me? Uh, okay. Did that fix it? I think that might be you. Okay, it's totally me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. Okay, so when you go warm outbound, this is a lead scoring. So this is maybe somebody who has interacted with seven pieces of content, who has attended a webinar, you've seen a trade show scan, they're a good ICP. So they have, they know your logo, they know your product, they're somewhat aware of your product differentiation, yet they don't yet have conversation interest. So the role of the SDR there is a little bit bigger, right? So I would pay, like here, I don't pay them per meeting because the number of meetings that come in through hand races is completely up to marketing. I pay them on responsiveness. When they're dealing, and then usually I cut, cut off there, and then my other SDRs are just outbound SDRs, and I pay them slightly different maybe for a cold outbound that I would do for a warm outbound. And you can see it. Like, do they know your, do they know your company? Do they, uh, if you say, I'm calling from outreach, do they know what outreach is? Right? That's already, that already gives you at least 30 seconds to pitch them. Do they know your product and what it does? Right? Do they know how you're different from all their competition? And then are they interested in starting a conversation? So this is a good idea for how you think about it. We pay our cold outbound SDRs a base salary, uh, a bonus on meetings that show up to the appropriate meeting. And they need to qualify those meetings in two areas, which is it has to be the right company and it has to be the right contact. And the right contact can be any of the five personas that we sell to. And the right company has certain criteria like size, revenue, headcount, location, whatever it is, right? Uh, while our inbound SDRs are not paid on number of meetings, they're purely paid on their responsiveness to requests. And then we always give our cold outbound SDRs a portion of revenue. And that might be 1% or 2% um, of the deal generated, while sometimes you can adapt that for warm outbound and either don't give them revenue or give them a smaller portion or things like that. Don't overcomplicate it. 
Um, I would just split inbound, outbound, and then understand where you're getting most of your leads from. Uh, the more, the colder they are, the more you can actually pay your SDRs. There it is. And, uh, and obviously that contributes to, to retention when you can like actually look at the way you break down the cost of acquiring a, a new customer. And you can see that so much of it is on the shoulders of marketing and SDRs that not to diminish the work of the AE, they do great work developing that opportunity and closing it. But you can kind of see in that um, slide why SDR comp maybe should be higher. Uh, we also had a really good question about career path uh, to, to do. Taylor, right? Taylor asked, maybe the question's gone. Uh, Max, how would you talk to a more senior SDR team, I'm guessing that's team member, about a career path when there are no other sales roles to promote them into? Um, I would, my best advice is treat your SDRs just like AE. So how do you treat your more senior AE about career progression? Um, when there's no like VP of sales role to get promoted to, which happens all the time, right? And the thinking is make sure that they're happy being an, an AE for a long time. There's a lot of people who love being an AE. There's a lot of people who love being an SDR. Just take the tedious, boring parts out of their job, right? So don't have them do data research. Uh, rather than give them a promotion, uh, like invest in a data researcher that they can manage for themselves and put it on the company budget. That's going to make it infinitely more happy, right? And cover the cost of that or, or help them in, in other ways. Um, yeah, there's, uh, people are not just looking for money and they're not just looking for promotion or changes. Like sometimes you can be like, okay, you can work remote, especially if their commute's really long. Like the way I, uh, I ended up getting my head of sales development, who's like an amazing guy, is because he was really happy at his previous job. He had a good environment and everything. His commute was an hour and a half each way. I was like, with me, you can work from home or you can work from the nearest co-working space near you and I'll pay for the co-working space and I'll send you all the material. And then we're talking three times a week and I'll coach you and teach you how to be a better manager. The guy's like, sold, when can I start, right? Um, so think about what other areas matter to them, right? Learn a little bit more about their life and their job and ask him like, what, what, what stage of your life are you in right now? There's a really good book called Radical Candor that made me think about my employees in two different buckets, right? It's a good uh, book. Yep. You're either a, uh, a rock star or a superstar. I really love that concept. And a, a rock star is somebody who's like really good at their job. They want to stay doing their same job and they're optimizing for time off work. They want to spend more time going to the gym. They want to spend more time like with their family. They want to spend more time like doing things outside of work. And they just want to, they just see work as something they go do really well, do for eight hours and they're gone. And a superstar this is the complete opposite. They, they don't mind working 6 a.m. to midnight, Monday through Sunday. They just want more responsibility, more learning, better salary, more money, because that's what's hurting in their life. So understand what matters to your SDR uh, and what matters to your AE and, and just optimize for that. Give them what they need. And when you give them what they need, they're going to be much happier with you. So this one's for both of you then. So for larger organizations that need to scale, and it's, I assume at some point the, the like role progression needs to be at least a little bit more formalized. So how, do you, how formalized do you make it? And is there a size organization in which you know you have to develop a career path, like a formal path from SDR to AE? Yeah, I think you can, you want to make the, the SDR to AE path, I think you want to formalize that uh, as, as much as you can, right? Like Tito sets the expectation in the interview, you know, 12 months, 18 months, that's, that's the window. Here's the criteria. Here's what you have to be proficient in. You have to, you know, hit quota for X amount of months uh, out of that 12 months. Uh, and you got you to make that really kind of rigid. But again, going back to like that everyone is unique. It's also important to have at, at the very beginning stages, those conversations around like, what are you optimizing for? Like, do you, what is your ideal career track? And you may have to build individual plans for, for each BDR. And it might not be just a cookie cutter, like, boom, here's, here's what the track is and, and follow it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I agree with that. I think there's a really easy hack that, 99% of companies don't do, which is have their AEs bought in 
to the idea that uh, they need to help the company build a career path. Uh, the way you do it is you have the SDRs participate in demos. So when they're entry level, you should have a bunch of demos recorded to learn a little bit about the product. And then later on, when they get promoted to a senior SDR, I would have the senior SDR uh, pick a few deals that they want to follow progress on and just join and be a fly in the wall, right? Join and just sit back, turn your camera off, and you can just say, you know, imagine Colin's the AE and I'm the SDR. Colin would join the call and say, hey, you know, Tito Board is uh, a colleague of mine. He's, he's learning a little bit more about our product. He'll just be in the background taking notes and, and he'll send the follow-up, right? And then your SDR is literally like, as they're learning how to be an AE, they're learning how you manage the conversation, they're taking notes, and then they're like showing you the draft for the email follow-up that then you can send. And then, you know, like I send it, and it's just like, you're coaching me into being an SDR by doing, and by looking at the conversation. And they don't need to join every deal, but if they can join then a first call, a second call, a third call, and a close, or whatever, a negotiation call, and if you can record every call, if you have a, very few companies, if any companies I know do this, like they have like, oh, I just sold whatever, I sold a company to Syngenta. Okay, here was my first call, my second call, my third call, my fourth call, my fifth call, all email follow-ups. Like here's the path, the exactly very clear what we went through and it, they, they closed. Like if you, if you have that, your SDRs are gonna become AEs so much more successfully and so much quicker. And I don't know companies doing that yet, and it's so easy with today's technology. Yeah. And how you, you, you mentioned something before that, that kind of lends itself naturally to encouraging that is if your comp structure for your BDRs or AD, A, or SCRs, sorry, includes like a one or 2% spiff on closed uh, revenue where they're going to be much more naturally curious to see, okay, where did that opportunity go after I handed it off? And they're going to want to jump on those calls because they're going to be like, oh, I want to see how this is going because you know, this could mean more money in my pocket. So I think creating that culture, that's a good way to do it. Yep. All right. So we've talked about um, setting expectations during hiring. We've talked about making your coaching more valuable and make, getting like more granular, not just talking about here's the metric you're missing, do something about it, right? Um, developing a career path early, giving them the right tools, don't make your SDRs do research. What else are we missing in this recipe for SDR retention? Uh, we talked about salaries too and adapting to those. comp. Comp. Um. Uh, what, I, I, they, they're going to need the, you know, marketing support is a big one. You know, like make sure that you, that you have the proper case studies built out, that you, you have, you know, testimonials and all those things that can, that can lead to frustration. I know I've been in positions in the past where, had to literally like create that on my own, which can be, which can be very frustrating. So make sure that they have, uh, have that in their hands as well. Yeah. Make their goals attainable. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you my last trick, which is make your SDRs look really good in front of their friends and especially their friends outside their organization. So one of the initiatives that we run at Alti sales is doing SDR precedence club every quarter. So every three months, every SDR who has hit their quota, uh, which is either 100% of your meeting quota set and 100% of your revenue quota achieved, or you've set 120% on either of those cases for the quarter, you qualify for President's Club. And what that means is we're going to send you down to Cancun. Uh, you're going to fly economy, cheapest flight we can find, but we're, you're going <laughs> to go for just three days for the weekend. Nobody needs to know you're flying the cheapest flight, but here's what you're going to do. We're going to do scuba diving or whitewater rafting or bungee jumping or snorkeling. We're going to do some cool activity. We're going to do a steak dinner. We're going to spend a bunch of money just like making you really happy and giving you the experience. Uh, you're not going to stay at a five-star hotel. So we try to both keep it low budget and make the experience amazing and make it frequent. So frequent travel rewards to your employees, like four times a year going to the beach paid by the company is an incredible award. It's an incredible satisfaction. And then when they can put it on their Instagram and humble brag to all their friends about like, ah, oh, the beautiful dolphins in Cancun, thanks sales hacker, or like thanks outreach for like sending me over hashtag number one sales trip, hashtag whatever, like dude, who doesn't want to do that as a 22 year old when all their friends are trying to gauge who's, uh, who's making it and who's not making it. Like, 
that's the horror mentality. They're like everybody really wants the Instagram, Instagrammable picture. So just do that. Throw initiatives where like where your SDRs can take incredible pictures and upload them and brag about it in a in a way that their friends outside the organization will be jealous, right? I think that's such a good point. And like I want to hammer that one home. I think that's it's so good. It's what I was mentioning before. Like these young people coming up that are hungry this status like you can save yourself a bunch of money on actually having to give them like big salary jumps and stuff if you're doing these initiatives like taking them to the beach or give them a a a micro promotion or whatever it is you play into this feeling of you know everyone wants to be seen as someone you know that has status whether it's for instagram or or something else so i think uh it's a, a great great point yeah, yeah, it's awesome. I love uh, it. the, the, the last thing I should say, Colin, here is uh, is that we're hiring actually. So if, oh, if cool. people are interested in joining uh, joining us um, on our career site, is there or they can just find me on LinkedIn. I my name is there, Tito Board. P- ping me a message and uh, and yeah, we're interviewing. We're we're growing fast, so it's exciting times and all these initiatives are are really cool. Best thing you can do for your career: go work for uh, go work for Tito. Yeah, just know you got to stay there for 12 to 18 months. <laughs> but you'll go to the beach. Yeah, but I you'll go to maybe four times a year. That's, that's pretty <laughs> If you're hitting goals, we're sending you to the beach six times within 18 months, right? And, uh, yeah. And so you're going to be swimming with dolphins and you have a great manager. And, and sometimes we can fast track people a little bit through management, but, but I don't want to. I don't want to set the bar at like you're going to get promoted in nine months and then be like, oh, sorry, dude, it's going to take 16, right? Yeah. I'd rather say it's going to take 16 and, and if the opportunity comes in nine, you're going to be really stoked about it, right? So uh, you got to commit to 12 to 18, but uh, but yeah, if you're okay with that and, uh, and if you want to have a great career and short commute and a great support and all that, like why, why not? I, I don't think it's a, it's a bad idea to go really hone in your skills for sales development. And for me, I mean, the coolest thing is that they'd get to learn from you and the rest of your team of superstars. I know I learned a lot uh, from both of you today, so I appreciate you giving us the time. Thanks for the awesome uh, participation to the Sales Hacker community in the Q&A. I know we didn't get to quite every single question, so if we missed any, we'll follow up with answers to you. Um, And just remember, this link is coming out. Uh, why don't we end with a quick, here's a really good quick question for you, Tito, from William Fisher. Are there any great books or podcasts that you would recommend? Uh, best books. Um, it depends what the target audience is. Like if they're very, if they're like entry level SDRs, I'd have them read uh, fanatical prospecting and the sales development playbook. Uh, those are two good, like entry level resources. If you're a SDR leader or you're want to get like ahead in your career, uh, go look at the sales acceleration formula. Um, uh, Radical yeah. Candor is another one that's really good. Um, uh, if you're more on the operation side, uh, I would I will definitely go read the Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss to learn how to like outsource the Philippines resources, optimize workflow, effectiveness versus efficiency, things like that. So I have a I have an endless list of uh, books. Just start reading. Uh, interesting like bestseller top books and and don't just try to follow exactly what they say but uh, I, I stole this idea from Josh Brown he has a really good podcast uh, inside sales podcast I think it's called with Josh Brown but he says your your life's think about your life as a jelly bean jar and just you gotta go and find the jelly beans from other people that that really fit with your personality and put them in your jar so don't try to copy anybody else but steal an idea or two from different people and then you're going to have your own mix and that's what's going to make you unique and you have your, your unique jelly beer jar, jelly beer jar. But, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, I think it's that. a good analogy. That's awesome. Jelly bean jar. Uh, <laughs> what a way to end. All right. We're up against the end of the hour. Thanks again, Tito and Scott for joining. Loved hearing your thoughts on SDR retention. I hope we gave you guys, the sales hacker community, some good tips, some ideas about how to improve that and why it's important. Uh, Come back next time. We have a bunch of great webinars coming up. So uh, keep us in mind. We'll see you around. Bye, everybody.